Mr. Uh, William Durbin. And at this point, as I said at the very beginning of, of the hearing, if, if there's some things that we sort of touched on, then let's, let's just try to move on, okay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and I will do that. Um, I have prepared remarks. I'm going to abandon them based on what I've heard. Um, my name is William Durbin, and I urge passage of Bill 1536. Are you, I'm are you here representing anybody? Um, no, I do have dental clients, but no one in particular, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I am a corporate lawyer, if you will, by training and not a litigator. And as I've come to learn how the process works within Medicaid dentistry, I've become fearful. And I've watched clients quake in their boots, not knowing if and when the government would show up. And um, in my 30 years of practice, I have never witnessed a process like this. The lack of due process has reached the point that I would not recommend being a Medicaid provider. There's too much uncertainty. When I listen to Dr. Dunn, if I could explain my understanding of the orthodontic procedures, my understanding is 100% of all orthodontic submissions were approved by the government or its agents. So, and, and Representative Fallon, I guess, was asking, well, maybe, and perhaps I heard you implying that, well, maybe Dr. Dunn there was something you did that was wrong with respect to filing or filling out your orthodontic approval forms. My understanding is all the orthodontic submissions were rubber stamped by the government and now the government is coming back and saying we want you all to pay. So I believe that honorable man, Dr. Dunn, he struck me as being highly credible. He's been bankrupted and he's treating everyone with respect instead of coming in with guns a blazing. He moved my heart, and I think he's a victim. I heard him saying he chose to work for the Medicaid system to do good, and this is what he gets. He says 86% recruitment. I don't believe it. I don't believe that man's a thief, and yet he's being financially ruined. I was going to talk to you about credible allegations of fraud. We're here to, to get a, a hearing before a district court judge. I hope you get there, but that's not far enough. I mean, under the Affordable Care Act, all the government has to talk about, and Mr. Sticks um, mentioned it, the, the test is a credible or an, an indicia of a credible allegation of fraud. An indicia, if you're a lawyer, is a scintilla or a minute piece of evidence. The government doesn't have to prove that it's probable that you committed fraud, that it's more likely than not. It's just that there's a reason to believe, and it could be based on an anonymous caller, just as Mr. Sticks had suggested. The fact is the government is putting people out of business and people are going untreated, kids who need blown-out mouths fixed. And I, I submit to you that's a high societal cost to pay. And where are these kids going to go if they don't go to their neighborhood dentist? They're going to wind up in an emergency room or in a, in a hospital, and the costs are going to be even higher. And then I hear things like, well, the government isn't recouping money. They just identified money. Well, they're bankrupting the people they're supposedly going to recover money from. Mr. Chairman, they're not going to recover money. The money's gone, or it's been used up paying lawyers. Nobody wins, and it is retroactive. And maybe people made mistakes. And I'm sure there's people out there that are bad guys. Put them away. But innocent people are being hurt and jobs are being lost. I have a client that let go a lot of people based on a payment hold just a few weeks ago. And all of those employees are beholding to and highly respect their employer. But their employer had no choice. My suspicion is many of these cases don't make it to a hearing because the providers go out of business. They shut down and say, I can't pay my bills, I can't pay my employees, and I can't pay my lawyers. So recognizing that this hearing has gone far overdue or on too long, I think I will just stop, perhaps submit myself to questionings, and thank you very much for taking this issue, this very important issue, seriously. Thank you. Members, any questions? Ms. Yes. Fallon? 
Dr. Durbin, uh, thank you for your testimony. Mr. Durbin, I'm a lawyer now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm promoting I, you. I'm not that smart, but thanks. <laughs> You can call me Senator Fallon. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, Mr. President. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mr. Durbin. <laughs> Don't tell her. <laughs> Please proceed, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> um, do, you All know, right, boys. All right. Do, 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 are you? I mean, I'm honestly just trying to, to, to vet this a little bit, and I'm trying to understand. You know, this is all new to me. I'm a freshman. I've only been out here two months. Do you, are you familiar with uh, Mr. Dunn's case, other than what you heard today? No, you, I never. Neither was I. I. I know him only because I know his lawyer. Okay. Right. But I did, did never heard his name before. Uh, and I've heard cases like his through his lawyer. So do you, you know, you, you stated that you felt he was pretty much unjustly accused. Do you, so do you think they're, the department, uh, the in, officer inspector general, is out for witch hunting and, and things like that? Because I don't know much about his case other than what he just said and what we've asked Mr. Stick. So I'm not going to jump to a conclusion saying he's guilty or that he's innocent. And you said rather emphatically that he was an innocent man and even pointed to him rather in dramatic fashion, almost like what I see in Law & Order kind of thing, which is cool because it's interesting and it well, keeps us awake. But you, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, I don't know. and I, So I think it might have been a leap to a conclusion perhaps. Yeah. But, um, first, my gestures were sincere. I'm not a trial lawyer. And um, Thank God. if I look like Law, law & Order, Thank you very much. Um, I believe the man. I, I never heard of his name before, but he strikes me as a very credible witness. And what I base my conclusions on were that I've heard a lot of talk within the industry among orthodontists and clients of mine who have received similar treatment. And that is, once again, they submitted approval forms to the government which were approved and as I understand it there's this diagnosis called the topic eruption that involves a lot of subjectivity in it and different dentists or orthodontists can view it differently and I think the government's agent and Mr. Sticks I guess would know better than I do I've never met Mr. Sticks before um, but my understanding is the government agent virtually rubber stamped all of those submissions. So every orthodontist is potentially at risk. And it's a fearful thing to have the government coming after you retroactively after they told you it's okay. We want you to do this work. So, did I answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Members, any other questions? You know, and maybe. Um, Forgive me if you're not the right person to speak to this issue, but, you know, one of the concerns that I do have um, is that we talked about earlier one of the, um, the, the, uh, the dentists that came up here, the orthodontist that came up here says, this is a provider issue, and it is. Um, the district that I represent has an issue um, with getting good providers to come in and do and accept Medicaid um, because not a lot of people want to do it. And what we're seeing, too, in the district that I represent is we have these big clinics now coming down specifically with, with treating, um, uh, you know, uh, doing pediatric dentistry. And how does the system, if you're familiar, treat the, the pediatric dentists different than maybe, or, or orthodontists different than perhaps the, um, you know, mom and pop dentist shops that are, are available because it's sort of my understanding that maybe some of those larger clinics are owned by, and I could be way off base and this may be hearsay, but they're owned by hedge fund owners out in, in New York City and, and they're subject to different rules because they're not actually um, owned per se by dentists themselves. They're set up as a corporation which is slightly different than <coughs> When you have a doctor dentist that are that are owned by the actual licensed dentist versus this sort of corporation, which is completely foreign to me, since like you, I'm, I'm an attorney. I'm also not a trial lawyer. Pat, just, I know I like to just just to let you know. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, are are they treated differently in these types of of Medicaid fraud cases, to your knowledge? If I understand the question, you're asking for a distinction between are mom and pop dentists treated differently than 
larger organizations that have private equity or hedge fund investments? Right, exactly. And I don't want to name names of certain no. clinics or what have you, but... No, uh, well, I don't claim to be a th an authority, but the Medicaid rules of fraud apply equally to everybody, whether you're Warren Buffett or humble Bill Durbin. Okay. It doesn't matter who you are and where you're from and who the investors are. Are you, pr are you charging for services that you did not do? Or are you upcoding them, which is again charging for more than you did? So I don't. I think that's a. So that so the dentist that works in that in that in a big clinic, for example, is going to be subject to that same loss of business and penalty as the that's, good doctor that came in here and basically is, is unfortunately now bankrupt. Absolutely. Okay. I've never heard that distinction drawn. As a matter of fact. Uh, I don't know who, who would suggest it or why. One other thing, if I may say, I, I want to be clear that um, in, in terms of the OIG and their intentions, they have a job to do, which is to enforce the loss. And I assume that perhaps they're underfunded and maybe they're taking shortcuts. And I wouldn't want to have Mr. Sticks's job, but this statistical extrapolation, just as a, from, from, being a graduate of law school 30 years ago, that would scare the holy heck out of me. To, to take a very small sample and say, well, if we find errors here, then we're going to extrapolate. I want to look at that sample very carefully. And I believe that the samples that were taken from my client were wholly inappropriate. I'll just say that. Wholly inappropriate. Members, any other questions? Thank you.